All right, good afternoon. I'm David Heeman, and this is teaching project-based STEM lessons without losing your mind. Uh, we have a couple people joining in, and so we're gonna give everybody just a minute to get started. Um, we have Megan Wetzel down there in the corner from stem.org. So we will get started with the agenda and uh, some introductions here in just a minute. While you're waiting, you could check out some of our websites here. We have creationcrate.com, stem.org, and girlsthatmake.com. Um, so those are some, some sites that you can check out, but this is who's sponsoring the webinar today. All right, so in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, this is teaching project-based STEM lessons without losing your mind. Um, the way that we came up with this title is uh, we at Creation Crate actually polled a number of our customers and we got online on Facebook and we asked for suggestions of what topics would be good for us to cover in a webinar. And since we do have a lot of instructors that are using our platform, whether it's the subscription platform or whether it's the actual classroom kits, we did get a lot of questions uh, around managing the classroom. And so since I did that teaching a STEM engineering class and Megan has a number of years in the classroom and has also been with STEM.org uh, for how long? It'll be about a year now. About a year, oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in the classroom for? I was in the classroom for three to four years. Three to four years, okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me go to our next slide here. All right, so there were a couple of uh, specific items that kind of came up as themes that we want to address today in this webinar. And the first is student engagement. So we know that they're getting you know, inundated with all kinds of information from lots of different sources. And so many things are way more entertaining than their teachers. It is hard sometimes to get students engaged and really actively interested in the educational process. So we'll talk about a few tips and tricks on how to do that in your classroom. And Megan will be talking a lot about that since she has some good ones. Uh, next is time, time management. Um, you know, in the message, if you wanna see if you get the reference here, I don't, uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe you gotta be a little bit older to get that reference, but we will talk about time management in the classroom and how to do uh, a better job making sure that you have lots of time to work on the projects themselves. So um, I'll give you a few tips from my class about that. Educational value, so finding uh, STEM projects that are actually easy to implement into the classroom. So you can find lots of different projects and some of them say that they're STEM and they're just maybe kind of arts and crafts projects. They don't have curriculum behind them. They don't have assessments, milestones, things that a teacher actually needs to be able to track back grades. So where you can find that information easily, um, Megan has a bunch of resources and, and actually a way to evaluate STEM programs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, budget, right? So we don't always have the money, so we have some free resources that we'll talk about and some good paid resources that we'll talk about um, and some ways to raise the funds that you need, all right? Some, some different than grants, so maybe some other options you haven't really, really heard of before. So here's the agenda. Who do you think you are? We'll do a quick uh, couple of introductions. Please play along. Uh, you can submit questions in the messaging. And if you are listening to this on the recorded version, then you should see off to your right, you can send us an email with your questions and we'll be able to answer those as a follow-up. Give me the goods. So here are our topics again, combating distractions and apathy. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. There's your hint mining for quality content and the champagne taste with a beer budget. How do you address that? You missed a spot will be where uh, you can ask questions that if we haven't covered it in the rest of the webinar, this is a good place to catch up. And then now what? We'll talk a little bit about some other options that you have with Creation Pay and uh, STEM.org. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna hand this, oh wait, sorry. Here's our introductions, that's right. Um, Megan Wetzel, as we said, is from STEM.org. Uh, she's been with them for about a year. She's in the classroom for a couple of years, and right now she is their content director. Andrew Raup um, also has joined us, but he is the founder and CEO of STEM.org, which he founded about 12 years ago. STEM.org's mission really is to help um, students, teachers, and others uh, identify good quality STEM products. So that goes from everything like Rubik's Cube that they, that, they, that they work with 
and to identify those products that actually meet a rigorous criteria around what constitutes a good STEM product, something that uh, does have high educational value and lots of resources along with it. Also, uh, credentialing for teachers. So they've been doing a, a, an in-person credentialing for a number of years, um, which really um, is, is priced well for a live uh, credential service, but they've actually got an online version that we will talk about and make available to you guys at the end. Uh, but again, their objective is to take all these STEM resources and put them in one place and to make them easily and readily available to teachers and students and other people in makerspaces and libraries and so on. Uh, I'm David Heeman. I'm one of the co-founders of Creation Crate. I have my partners, um, uh, Ryan and Chris, and Chris actually founded Creation Crate out of a need for, you know, having some opportunities outside of the classroom to learn things that he wasn't being taught in school that he thought was important. And that's kind of where Creation Crate got its start. And then Claire is Girls That Make. She is co-founder. This is our sister brand. And we have projects that, um, that she's working on that make it uh, females a little bit more uh, into STEM. So they do some wearables and some other cool projects. And that kind of rounds out the team that we have right now. All right, please play along again. We have an agenda, but we can ditch that at any time, depending on where the conversation goes. We want to be prepared and make sure you get the most out of this webinar as possible. Uh, but if a lot of questions come up about a certain topic, we'll definitely take time and make sure to answer them for you. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Megan. She's going to talk a little bit about how to combat distractions and apathy in the classroom. Go ahead, Megan. Thanks, David. So when we started talking about the distractions and apathy, we want to first look at teaching what's relevant. If we can get students involved in what they're learning, this is how we can get them excited. Uh, and then they, they want to pursue that knowledge as well. So when you're doing this, you want to focus on bringing a real world challenge. And it needs to be a challenge that has multiple solutions. When it comes to STEM, STEM isn't about finding that one answer. STEM is about finding different solutions um, for problems. And we find that this is one way that um, students uh, begin to strengthen their skills that they'll need for uh, the, you know, in their careers, which many of the careers they will be getting ready for aren't around yet. Um, you also wanna have a challenge, a real world challenge that involves the engineering design process. Something that takes them through steps to be able to then create a prototype. Uh, usually with the younger grades, it might be helpful to break down those steps first instead of just throwing this process at them. But by the time you get to high school, high school students, you really want them to um, go through the process, create this prototype, and think of it like the scientific method, right? You're not going to go in exact order each time, but it's a guide to help you to get to that solution. Uh, and so you also want to... Megan, for those that may not be yeah. uh, familiar with the scientific method or that design yeah. process, um, can you highlight those bullet points? Yeah. So we first start with like imagining in your brainstorm. So you're presenting students with this challenge. This challenge could be, you know, hey, by a nearby pond, there's pollution. You know, what prototype could you create to take care of this pollution? Maybe it's a prototype that picks up trash. Uh, maybe it's a prototype that helps uh, with cleaning the water, something that can move around and pick up trash. So you want to start with presenting this challenge to students, and then they're going to brainstorm ideas. Once they begin brainstorming, then they're going to start, uh, the, they can draw it out. Yeah, yeah, they're going to start yeah. drawing it out. The list materials they need, you know, what do we need to be successful? Uh, they're going to start creating this prototype. They're going to test the prototype. Um, and then this is when you might go, uh, you know, back into the engineering design process, right? If my mm -hmm. prototype isn't going to work, I might have to go back and retest or look at, you know, my drawings and see what went wrong. Uh, but in the end, what's really helpful is allow students to present their project. Um, they're working on soft skills, but then they also have a reason for completing these projects. So they can share their project with local businesses, maybe uh, like a parent night, uh, or even just presenting to their other classmates. I think that's an overall, it's pretty important, something that they, you know, can work towards. 
Uh, and then you want to make sure it's aligned with grade level standards. Of course, you know, we either have our next generation state standards or our common core. Uh, but again, everyone's a little different. The states can be different on what uh, standards are available. We just want to make sure that you're aligning with um, what's needed. Overall, what's important is your students have a voice. So, you know, Maybe you can start by giving real world challenges, but in the future, allow students to choose what they would like to do You can talk with other businesses, see what problems are out there. Uh, actually, Cedar Point just did this huge project and they said, hey, we have some challenges here at Cedar Point. We have issues with traffic, issues with trash, uh, you know, just things that you might see with amusement park. And they had students come in and complete, you know, find solutions to these problems and then they won some tickets afterwards so check check with local um, businesses and see you know what they need and that helps keep students pretty excited as well if you feel stuck uh, and you need some ideas check out the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges uh, and engineering everywhere curriculum units they'll have lesson plans for you to help you with those challenges and if you want to focus more on high school, try Rutgers today. And that could help give you some ideas and get you going with STEM activities. You know, one of the things that I like is um, to have them have competitions, right? So my students have been yes. in, uh, my kids have been in TSA, Technology Student Association, uh, first Lego League and first robotics, there's VEX Robotics. There are a lot of organizations out there already that have uh, different types of STEM uh, competitions. Even like TSA, mm -hmm. even within TSA, they have like a hundred different categories, even all the way from story writing um, to solving pollution problems. Um, and yeah. that sort of begins with the end in mind. That's one of the things that I like to say is if, if they know where they want to get to and they would want to get there, right, which is part of the buy-in, um, then getting through all those challenges along the way is a little bit easier. Right. So if right. it's something that you, right. I, it happens with my son all the time. But like I tell, him, <laughs> I tell him to clean his room and then I go and look at his room and it looks like a mess still. And I'm like, are you serious? This is what you're coming up with. And I tell him, I said, look, if it was something you really wanted to do, you would pay more attention and you would like spend the time doing it. And, and I know the quality of work you can do. And this is not it for your room. Right. Why? Because he doesn't care if his room is clean. I, I care if his room is clean. But when he really cares about hooking up speakers in his car, like, OK, now he's going to take it to the nth degree. Uh, you mm -hmm. We talked a little bit offline about some of the polling that you've done in your classes to kind of mm -hmm. find out what what's interesting. And I think we do have some resources that you guys are going to make available that um, that I think you've done that with. Can you explain your process and, and how you did that in your classroom? Yeah, um, I've used a lot of different apps for my classroom. One that was my favorite. Um, it's I um, I couldn't think of the name off the top of my head, but uh, what I can do is we can put it in an email after. But mm -hmm. there's these really cool cards where each individual student gets their own card, and on the card is uh, like a QR code, and so it's kind of like a multiple choice or a true or false. And what you can actually use for like polling is you take this app um, and you can scan the room and it pulls uh, the students. So it, you know, if you want to answer the question about their um, progress, uh, mm -hmm. I think you'll talk later about, um, you know, kind of those ticket out the doors. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's another way to get students excited. I know my students loved watching when their name popped up and their answer was yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you could also see how many percentage of students, you know, understood that concept or how far they are in their project. Uh, so that was one great way to pull. Um, I'll have to get the name for you for the email, but there's many different ways. Um, for me, I just, I do a lot of my research through like the teacher, pay teacher sites, or mm -hmm. um, when I go to conferences, you can hear a lot about these apps and uh, you know, what's new for teachers as well. So that's how right. I keep to date with, up to date with everything. Plus like, if zombies are the, the flavor of the day, then make your STEM yeah. project around zombies. And if they love skateboarding, yeah. if they're all into that, or music, whatever it might be, engineering touches just about anything you can think of. So it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to kind of cross that and tie that all together. Yeah, and students are pretty happy to share you know, their insights with you. They, wanna, mm -hmm. they want you to know what they like. So when we talked to teachers that use our modules, um, you know, we said, okay, what else can we come up with? And you might right. hear a little bit, uh, you know, we really want 
mobile and app, you know, mobiles with phones. How can we get involved with that? So then we have our mobile madness module. Uh, it's just about listening to your audience and hearing what they have to say. Yep. Um, um, we, yeah, we touched a oh, little bit about learning styles. How does that play into how engaged the students get? Right. Well, it's always important to have different aspects to your STEM program or, you know, your classroom in general. Um, instead of just focusing on what we usually see would be this lecture type of format. And so we saw that over time and as STEM is continuing to become popular um, and even STEAM, you know, including those arts, we really focus on how it's implementing different learning styles, whether it's physical, you know, your hands on activities, um, including visual, um, auditory, uh, using, you know, groups uh, for your challenges, verbal, sharing that project afterwards. Right. So just including all the different styles helps you reach each student into that STEM project. I, I know for me personally, like, I love learning stuff. I'm just yeah. not a good reader. Like, I start reading and my mind just goes elsewhere. So for mm -hmm. me, it's the physical part of it. I just like to jump right in and get started and me figuring yes. it out and like processing that in my brain is what helps it stick. Other people mm -hmm. love reading, other people can hear something one time and they'll remember it. Um, some people like to work in groups and, and some people like to work individually. So I think if you can right. figure out ways that whatever project you're working on, they can, they can work in those different ways, you start to get the, the different students engaged really, whatever kind of learning style they have, they can be engaged. Yeah, and I think teachers always ask, well, what if I have to give instructions or that kind of introduction? And that's yeah. perfectly fine to do. Like, you you should right. do that. And you need to share how that's going to be completed and share the criteria on how students are going to be successful. Um, right. But then, you know, research also tells us keep it, you know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on grade levels. And each grade level can have a certain amount of time. Uh, but those are just little things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that I did in my classroom when we get to time management. Which, good segue, right? right. Um, time keeps on slipping. So like, I had a unique situation um, in my classroom. So I've spent like 25 years in corporate America and then I started teaching. So we, they just opened a, a STEM education center. We had um, like an audio visual lab, we had a coding lab, an engineering lab, which I was in. And that engineering lab, we built balsa wood gliders and mousetrap cars. Now, ours was a unique situation. We had sixth and seventh graders in the school, and I saw every class, um, I, I saw five classes of each every single day, so I had 10 classes. I only had 30 minutes with them, so they split 30 minutes uh, STEM and 30 minutes PE. And being a green teacher, knowing nothing about being in the classroom, I mean, I'd coach my kids soccer, I did corporate training, and so I had some experience but trying to manage 250 students and 250 projects and, and cycling them in and out every 30 minutes was a huge challenge. So um, I had to implement a few tricks to, to make, you know, the amount of time that they had to be productive in class as much as possible. Because, you know, you got students coming in from PE, it could take you 10 minutes just to get them all calmed down. Um, and, and then 10 minutes to get them to clean up, 10 minutes, so we had to shorten that beginning and end a lot. So the first is having your classroom set up. I know it kind of without saying, but if you're used to having the students come in and get all their stuff and get started, uh, it, it, if, you, if you have some of that stuff ready for them as soon as they walk in the door, it's gonna be a lot easier. Um, we also had to deal with storage, not only of the tools, so each of the desks, and they were labeled specifically. So it said there was supposed to be one roll of masking tape and five pencils and two pairs of scissors or whatever that is, so that at the end of the class, they were accountable to make sure everything was in there. And I wouldn't lose a pencil for a whole nine weeks, like seriously, because I wouldn't let them out of their seats until all five or whatever number of the toolboxes were completely accounted for. So you would see kids searching high and low for a single pencil. Um, but, and it's really the principle involved, right? It's like everything was there when you got started. And so you could get to work quickly, make sure everything's there when you leave. So the next class that comes in, they can get started quickly as well. Also, we have 250 projects. We had a bunch of cubby holes to put them in and they were kind of open around the room. And then you get projects that get broken, 
parts that get stolen and so on. So we had to figure out a new solution. So you see a picture of a closet here. We put some shelving units that we begged and borrowed and stole from the cafeteria that they weren't using. And I got a bunch of banker boxes. And what I did is, is I assigned um, each team had their own box and the teams were only three to four students each. So that way at the end of class, they put their project in the box, the box goes in the closet and nobody touches it. So I only had one student from each class that was allowed to go into, um, that was allowed to go into the closet. Anybody else in there would automatically get detention. And that did a couple of things for me. Um, one, I could be assured that nobody touched anybody else's project from one day to the next. And they could also be assured that nobody's messing with their project. So then when somebody said, oh, so-and-so stole this or I can't find that, the ownership is on the team because they have to keep track of each other's projects. And then you're just dealing with a team of three to four people. They're concerned about each other's stuff and they make sure to keep track of it. Um, time management. So you see my little timer here. I started with an egg timer and then I ended up programming them onto the computer. And what I would do is five minutes before each class was up, an alarm would go off. And that alarm started going off and it was like kind of annoying little dingy, chimey thing in the background. And what I would do is I would leave it on until everybody had everything cleaned up. And so people would be like, oh, can you turn that off? And I'm like, just get everything cleaned up and I'll turn it off. And so I like, it was <laughs> just that little like nail on the chalkboard just enough. And, but it would remind students they had that five minutes, they got to clean up. It would encourage them to make others start cleaning up because they didn't want to hear that dingy, chimey sound the whole time. Um, but it was consistent every single day that five minutes at the end of class, that goes off. They have time to put their projects away, put all their tools away, make sure we have everything that we started with, get everything back into the closet, and then get them lined up so that we can transition out. Uh, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning of getting started, you know, kids coming in from PE, they're not all focused. They could be scatterbrained and hyper. And so what I would do is I would have them line up because I, I watched a YouTube video and it was talking about, you know, the way that they enter the class is usually the way the class is going to go. And so instead of letting them just go willy nilly right to their desks, they would all line up. I'd tell them I'm going to give you one to two minutes of instruction for the day so that they know exactly what to do. But I wouldn't start that until everybody was quiet and I had their attention. So again, the, the peer pressure, right, to get everybody to be quiet so that we could all pay attention. I could be in the middle of a sentence and I would just stop talking. And that was after a lot of practice of me trying to talk over them and yell and all this other stuff that didn't work. So me being quiet got them to be quiet. I could give them one or two minutes of instruction um, and then I would release them to their desk. Now, if they went wild after that, they were right back at the wall and we would do it all over again. And I've spent an entire class
All right, I'm sorry about that, folks. I lost my <laughs> internet connection for a second, so I am back. Um, I was talking about roaming around the classroom, so let me just pick up right there. Uh, making sure you get out and around the class. One of the things that helped me is that students want to lob questions at you from across the room. And what I would do is I would say, okay, I'm going to get to each team throughout the class because I can't just keep answering questions as they're coming at me. I'll go to your team, answer the questions, spend two minutes there, then go to the next team. And anybody lobbing questions at me, I would say, you have to wait. Or if they came up on me and started just getting in my face and asking questions, I would have them go back to their desk and uh, wait until I get around to the team. That helped me give even time. Plus, you have some students that are more vocal and, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, rude, and then others. And so the polite students sometimes don't get any attention, and the loud and boisterous students get all the attention. So instead of doing that, I went around to each one. Sometimes I would sit at my desk, and if it was a checkpoint, that which we'll talk about in a second, they would come up to me, show me their work, and I can check it off. So depending on what we were doing that day, I would either be up and about or they would be coming and lining up to me to show me what they had to do. Yeah, uh, and I appreciate your um, way that you did storage uh, because I actually, so, you know, storage can be so expensive that I actually yeah. worked with the lunchroom to get their milk crates. So, like, I would stack the milk crates and then zip tie them so that it would keep everything sturdy. And that's where, like, I could keep projects as well. Um, oh, but, so you put them so they were open. Yeah, like you have them like open shelves. and you can stack them. Yeah, they turn out just like shelves. So if you needed yeah. some more shelf space, I could just push it against my wall and you could create these big shelves to fit your projects. Or like sometimes I even had textbooks in them. Uh -huh. uh, but that's like another way for your storage as well. That's awesome. And Andrew was talking uh, earlier about uh, he had a, an electronics teacher that just got some ice cube trays. And they would right. put all those tiny resistors and all those little electronic mm -hmm. parts in there. And what's cool about the ice cube tray is that they're kind of uh, they're rounded in the corners, so it's easy, it's easy yes. to scoop stuff out. So as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, that, that's that's a great idea. Uh, it's we perfect. Just, you don't lose those little devices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we had like a, we just have like little plastic Tupperware bins or whatever that have a lid on it, and then I would put those in cubby holes. So. I would get those out, put them out, and then for the sixth graders, they'd have different tools, collect those up, put them back out for the seventh graders, and so on. Um, all right, a couple of other time management uh, things that I did. Having the information that student needs available to them is really important because if I'm the only one that can answer their question, then I'm a bottleneck, and I can't just answer questions for 25 students because what's going to happen is there's going to be one student that has a question, and they're going to waste inevitably the entire class waiting on me to answer their question because they won't do anything else until they get that question answered, right? Um, so some people probably have heard of three before me, which is you need to ask three other students in the classroom before you come to the teacher. So they will come up to me and I'd say, okay, did you ask three before me? Oh yeah, nobody else knows. And I'll say, okay, who did you ask? Oh, well I asked Susie and I'll go, hey Susie, uh, Bob says that you have no clue what you're doing and you don't know the answer to this question. And they'd be like, yeah, I do. I said, good, go ask Susie then. So I would really call them out right in class because basically what they're saying is that who they ask is clueless. And as soon as I told that person, they'd be like, no, I'm not. And so that helped get them in the habit of actually asking people. The other thing that I would do is I would have at least three to five resources somewhere in the classroom where they can find the answer. So that goes uh, with classroom prep. Um, you can see here I had foam board with all the parts glued onto it and labeled. I had them glued on here with all of the steps so they could walk up. Because always they're asking me, well, how do I build this? What does this look like? Well, they could see right there a physical representation of each step in the classroom. Plus, I started recording videos, and that was really out of necessity. You can see this picture right here where I got my safety glasses on. Like, you can only cut something one time and then it's the right size and glue it back together and whatever. So when another student in class who either wasn't paying attention or they were absent, they come up and they want me to show them how to do it, I can't. I mean, I'd be building 50 projects every single time, every nine weeks. And so I just handed my phone to one of the students, had them record what I was doing, put it up on my YouTube channel, and then that way the students can go back and they can see exactly what I taught. And then I turn that into the reverse classroom, which is a couple bullet points down. 
So that way, instead of having to do a lot of that instruction in class, I would have the students watch it before they get to class. So they at least understand the concept of what they're doing that day. And then when they come in, they can get right to it and start working on it. And they have their Chromebook so they can fast forward and rewind and they can do it as many times as they need to. Plus, then I have students that are accelerated and so they're done ahead of time. They're always ahead of everybody else. So I got two things out of this. One is they could keep moving without me. Again, I'm not the bottleneck. They could keep going and get their project done. But what was really cool is once they got their project done, then they're a new resource for me to help other students. And usually those are the ones that, that can help out. And so once they are done with their project, I'd say, oh, okay, can you go help Susie? She's really far behind. And then that way they can spend some quality time. I know it's somebody who knows what they're doing because I already saw them build a project. Um, oh yeah, that's, oh, you'll answer my question. This was another thing I, I kind of, I don't know where I got this. I just started doing it, I think. Um, you have your, overly enthusiastic students that want to answer every single question. So my first rule was that you can only answer one question in class a day. That was it. And so I would tell those overachievers that like wait for a tough question or even if it was a simple one, I go, come on, Susie, do you really want to answer that question or let somebody else have it? Okay. And so then the other students, it would force other students to participate. But if nobody was participating, then I call on you. And if I call on you, that question is yours forever until the end of time until you answer it. So whether that was 20 minutes later in class, whether that was the next day, whether it was the next day, whether it was the next week, they never got out of answering a question if they were called on. They had to come up with that answer. And so that way, more students are paying attention. Um, more students will answer right away if they're smart and get, take the easy questions. So I got a little bit more participation out of it, people paying a little bit more attention. Um, and that was kind of fun because I'd write their name on the board and then the next day they'd come in and say, hey, do you have my answer? And I'm like, oh. So they finally got in the habit of doing that. And then the last thing is these, uh, well, no, there's checkpoints. So um, one thing when I got into doing these STEM projects, I thought, okay, when they're done, I'll give them a grade. And that sort of made sense in my mind, but it didn't really work out practically because uh, you know, you have all these projects and you really don't know where people are at in the process and you get all the way up to when it's almost done and you, or they're supposed to be done and you realize that like two thirds of the class isn't even past step two. So that was not working out for me. Plus I needed more grades than just one grade at the end. So I broke everything down into steps. I gave them a checklist and every time they got one of the items done, they were to come up to my desk, I would check it off so I could make sure that they were doing step one right before they get all the way to the end of the project and it's a mess. I could figure out if they were moving in the right direction first. And half the time I'd say, did you watch the video? Oh yeah, I watched it. No, you didn't. Yeah, I watched that front. No, you didn't. Because if you watched the video, you would not have done it like this. So go back and watch the video and come back and tell me what you did wrong. So again, I can put that, um, the learning ownership back on them. And they have to go and use their resources, use the tools that they have, figure it out and get it right, and come back. And so each of those checkpoints was a grade. Having it done on time was a full grade. So basically it was like, did you do it? It's a hundred. And if you didn't do it, it's a zero. If you did it on time, it's a hundred. If it's a day late, it's a 90, 80, 70, 60. And that helped them keep on track. So it wasn't, was it beautiful? Was it perfect? Did you do it? Does it look right? Will it work? Okay, that's fine. And you get 100 on that. So it's a really easy grade if they just kind of keep moving along with the class. And the last is incentives. So I gave points at the beginning of class if we were ready and working within the first two minutes. If people were participating, working on their projects, I didn't hear a lot of clowning noise is what I called it. I said, there's working noise and there's clowning noise. And that's a hard thing to manage sometimes. Um, in that environment where you have projects and everybody's like working, they're talking, like there's just a noise that happens when there's collaboration going on. And so the students know, they get it. And I would uh, also play music in the background for them. So I'd have Pandora playing and while they were working on their projects, they're listening to music. But if the working noise turned into clowning noise and I hear talking about Susie's boyfriend, Bobby's girlfriend and all this kind of stuff, I'd shut the music off. And so that was a big deal right there. And I would say, look, we got to get back to working noise because this, we're, I can tell we're not working on a project and y'all know what I mean. And they do, they get it. Um, but if, you ha if you're able to 
kind of, I could, just putting a label to it and saying working noise and clowning noise, then they got it and I was able to speak to that. So that helped. And then I would give them incentives for being ready uh, at the bell to walk out of the classroom, everything cleaned up, everything put away. And then we had some incentives, you know, like some snacks at the end of the nine weeks for the class with the most points, something like that. Yeah. It's a good way to keep Oh, and Go I remember ahead. like when I was teaching, I always had a hard time of getting students to answer my questions. And I found mm -hmm. like, I don't know, have you ever heard of sticks where you have those popsicle sticks and at the end you put like a number on them and you put uh -uh. them in this cup. Well, so okay. um, like each student in your class has a number. And so, which is great, you can reuse these. So if you're a middle school teacher, you can reuse numbers, but you pull uh -huh. a stick and it has a number. And so that kid would answer your question. So it keeps oh, okay. everyone engaged. But the yeah. thing is, too, is that you could pull a stick and then say, you know, this number has already been called, right? You can just call out a different number without them really knowing. Right, and, right. You know, so you just put it right back in. They're on their seats. They're thinking, you know, okay, got to be ready to answer this question. Right. And you can still kind of control, uh, you know, who's involved. You know, if you want to wait for that hard question for your student that really knows what's going on, maybe you save their number for that. Yep. That was like another way I try to keep everyone involved. Cause I know I'd have students yeah. who, you know, they just, they're a little shy, but if they knew that, okay, you know, the sticks are coming out, just make sure you're paying attention and you're ready. They felt more comfortable to participate as well. You know, another thing I like about that is that it's more, uh, feels more random and then yeah. there's no, nobody feels singled out. Because right. students will feel like, oh, you're picking on me. Well, not if I'm just picking a, a stick at random. So I love that idea. Exactly. I'll Good one. Yeah. Good one. And, you know, the videos, I like that you're doing the videos as well. Because I know a lot of teachers who put them on their teacher websites. And mm -hmm. the parents can go back and watch those as well. So, you yeah. know, they have confidence knowing what's going on in your classroom. And then your students know, hey, if I miss a day, everything's right there. So what a great way to keep everyone involved by doing those videos. Plus, I found that uh, people all across the country and even in some other countries mm -hmm. were watching my videos. So really, yeah. I had a captive audience of people that needed to watch them. But two thirds mm -hmm. of my YouTube views were from other states. Yeah. So it was it's amazing. People were yeah. building these things and they were looking at the stuff that we were making in our class. So it was kind of fun. Well, and that's what I love about teaching is being able to share those ideas with one another. Everyone's yeah. pretty open with that. Well, mm -hmm. I think that's another good segue right into mining for quality content. Um, which right. I know STEM.org is really trying to aggregate the best of the best information. So um, how about talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, because there's so much content out there. How are you going to know what's appropriate and what's not for your classroom? Um, especially with STEM, for a lot of us, it can feel like a whole new concept. And what I try to remember others is that, you know, it's not this whole concept or a whole new subject, STEM. It's, it's really, it's an approach to the classroom and a strategy for teachers to use to bring science, engineering, technology, and math all together. So I think if you kind of see this as a way, as an approach to teaching, it doesn't feel as, uh, you know, overwhelming. You're able to realize, oh, I'm, it's, I've been doing this the whole time. I'm just now really focusing on particular portions of STEM. STEM is about getting your students ready, like we talked about before, getting them ready for those jobs that aren't around yet, getting them ready for those 21st century skills and those social skills as well. One of my favorite um, educators is Ann Jolly, and she has a middle uh, web blog, and she also just came out with this book, STEM by Design. And this is a book that I've used for my own classroom and for my own research as I've got into STEM. Uh, so I would highly recommend her. And... Uh, one way that um, one way is to make sure you have STEM in your lesson is to use a STEM lesson checklist. This checklist we actually have in our STEM certification course uh, through STEM.org. And this checklist helps you to compare your lesson or other lessons to see if it's right, it's a right fit for STEM. So you, again, you know, Aligning to your grade level standards is always important. So when you're looking at content, is it aligned to what you need to teach? And then you want to look at multidisciplinary. Is it more than one subject? Right? Are we implementing arts? Uh, you know, don't forget your arts for STEM and STEAM. Uh, and you know, don't be afraid to implement social studies as well. It's about bringing all these concepts together for students. Yeah. Yeah. And for many, like STEM, it's 
considered two or more STEM, STEM subjects, that's when it's STEM. So if you have science and technology, then that can be considered STEM. But of course, we always want to focus on having all four concepts. That's when you really dig deep into STEM. Mm-hmm. Again, you want to make sure you're addressing the authentic challenges, bringing in what's going on in the local community, even around the world. We can bring in some culture as well um, and diversity into our STEM lessons by including what's going on in other countries. Uh, there's the integrating 21st century skills, you know, your critical thinking, creativity, innovation. Uh, make sure that there's more than one solution. We don't want to get to that idea of a math problem, right? You know, two plus two equals, and there's only one solution. We want to focus on STEM having more than one solution. I mean, that's what our problems are going, you know, when we have those problems going on in this real world, it's not just one solution fits all. There's many different solutions. And we also want to create this, it's okay to fail for students, right? right? If their solution doesn't work, that's okay. Um, you know, we always hear of uh, Steve Jobs, right? Having the failures that he had before he really got into Apple. Uh, I mean, you also think of Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, right? Mm-hmm. Which the time keeps slipping. I always think of Space Jam with Michael Jordan. So great, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great sports star there. Uh, and then, you know, also implementing the engineering design process, using those step by steps. Uh, just it's a way to help guide students through this big project. That way you're not just throwing the challenge at them and they're thinking, okay, where do I start? Well, they know where to start. They know that they need to brainstorm and they know that to be successful in STEM, they're gonna get to this prototype that uh, creates a solution to the problem. And then with um, STEM, oh, go ahead. You know, that was with with the planes and with with the cars, inevitably, you know, something is broken or, or it just doesn't work right. Yeah. So the final grade really was the finish line, that's a 100. And if yes. it got halfway across, it was a 90. If you put it there and the thing moved at all, it was an 80. So like mm-hmm. the worst grade that you could get was a B just by completing your project. So. Um, and that goes back to what you were saying. Sometimes it just doesn't work the first time. And right. you, you're allowed to fail. You probably will fail. You will fail way more yes. often than you see when when you're actually trying to do something and experiment. It, it's going to happen. So giving students right. the option not to, to, you know, the grade is, did you complete the process? Did you go through all the steps? Did you give your a, a good effort? And did you follow along? And did you, you know, actually do an experiment? Did you actually look at the results? Did you actually do those things? It's not whether or not the product at the end, the, the prototype at the end, actually worked. Um, you know, you don't have time always to do that. But going through that that right. process, I think you're talking about the yeah the engineering design process. Going through mm-hmm. that process really is the grade. It is. Yeah, because and like you've talked about before, having those steps. So kind of like those check in with students, you know, how are you doing with the create portion? You know, are you on track? And I think that also helps with time management, right? These skills that they're going to need for their career. All of this, we find there's just incredible benefits when doing these STEM projects that really Mm -hmm. link to what they're going to need in their careers. So, and you know, this being hands-on, making sure it's a project that includes hands-on activities, something that gets them involved. I know I learned best when I could put something together, something that was hands-on for me and that I could fit and work with. That's how I learned Mm -hmm. best. Yeah. Um, And then lastly, integrates technology. And I think sometimes I know for myself, I always get stuck that technology is just computers, phones, AI. But in reality, technology is, you know, it's a, a prototype that has allowed um, humans to work better. It's something that's helped uh, helped uh, humans to grow in this society. So mm-hmm. it doesn't just have to be your usual phone computer. There's a variety of technology. Right. So I try overall, to get that just look for those things. Too, yeah. Is that yeah. I think the first thing is that they don't really understand, like, for example, what engineering is. Uh, right. or, or how much actual coding goes into a video game mm-hmm. or creating a video game. A lot of them think it's just coding, but the reality is they have graphic artists, they have set designers, they have mm-hmm. story writers. Like 
all. There's so much that's involved in just making a video game, and there are so many different aspects. So whether I tell them, even if you want to be a fashion designer, well, good luck yeah. not knowing CAD because you're gonna have to have you know be able to put your designs into the computer at some point, and using computer aided design is pretty much a must for even fashion and for all kinds of things. I mean, you look right. around the classroom and everything's engineered, right? Everything has technology behind it. Everything is math. Like yes. there's no getting away from it. Everything is math. <laughs> Everything so is math. Students have to understand how those things actually are going to apply in their real life. Because like my son says, like, when am I ever going to use this in real life? Yeah. Well, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> yeah, is this be on the test? Yeah, exactly. The That's always the question. Life, I would get. Yeah, the test of life. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had a couple of questions come in, and there is a little delay in the webinar naturally. Um, but one of them was, um, let's see here, there, there was a question. If your school doesn't have a designated teacher, and I thought, Megan, you could ca catch this one. Um, what tips do you have for teachers to try and schedule it into their day? So if they don't have a like a designated STEM period or like time to do that. How do they work that into their normal classroom day to day? Right. As uh, when I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher, I uh, I had just my single classroom. And so a lot of it was, you know, it's not like middle school where you could have a designated room for STEM. So how could I bring that in into my elementary classroom? And what I found what's most important is making STEM multidisciplinary. So instead of right. just blocking off a science time or a math time, finding projects that implement the standards that you're teaching for science and math, putting it together into a STEM project. Really, mm -hmm. we find with these big projects, we can reach quite a bit of standards. Um, right. I know for me, for my first year teaching, I was my only mindset was, okay, I have to get to these standards. I have to make sure I have them complete. But right. in reality, we do complete these standards through these right. STEM projects and incorporating all these different subjects. So instead of blocking off our particular subject time, you know, block off for STEM time, but include your multidisciplinary subjects. And this will help you to be able to reach the standards or the needs that you have for your classroom. And you know what, I think I was surprised because, you know, you guys stem.org did um, look at creation create projects and I was surprised that you have this comprehensive 100 point rubric to analyze all the products. And I think you guys have approved over 850 of them, something of that yeah. number. So I'm sure you've evaluated a ton more than that. Um, but looking at how, how much, how those projects tie into the standards is Okay, well that's twice, so hopefully it doesn't happen again, but I got uh, bumped uh, from our internet connection. Um, okay, well let's go ahead and move on. We do have some other resources um, that we will provide at the end of this that we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, oh yeah, yeah. These are some of the resources. Good. Go ahead and take it. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, and you know, a lot of these things, if you know, we've talked about a little bit throughout this time, but uh, you know, it, a big thing is implementing STEM careers. You know, how do I even start mm -hmm. to do this? Yeah. That can. Uh, how do I get these businesses involved or even implement that into my lesson plans? And Rossi Learning Company and Nepris is a great way to do this. Nepris, you can schedule a time for a professional to come into your classroom through webcam. And, you know, they've had uh, zookeepers and they'll teach you kind of like the day to day schedule for that. And, you know, you can implement a lot of biology, anatomy, uh, and uh, Rossi Learning Company, uh, they will have free lessons for you. And then they'll also have a free trial available. Uh, some of the best lesson sites that I've used um, would be Better Lesson, Next Gen Lesson Plans. Better Lesson, uh, for sixth grade, I did not have textbooks for science. So Better Lesson helped to guide me through what I needed to teach for science for sixth grade. And it helps, uh, you can actually click through the standards you need. It has a ton of engineering projects. And really, it's brought by teachers. So it's teachers have used this in their classroom. They're figuring out what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, and, you know, there's always the comment section where it really helps to keep you up to date with what can work in your classroom. Uh, there's also the NGSS at NSTA. Those are great classroom resources. Teach Engineering is another uh, great resource, which particularly focuses on engineering. I think uh, with STEM, the engineering portion can be the most intimidating for teachers. So if you go to this website, it can help you with engineering as well. Then lastly, uh, if you feel that you would want to use an assessment or need rubrics, Easy Tagger and iRubric are great ways to help build assessments and you can edit them and make them work for your classroom. So a lot of these are some great resources that you can start using right away. And uh, one of the other questions that came in was about um, some good YouTube content. I don't know if you have some go-to YouTube channels. I have a few. I actually have more than, than we can talk about right now. But I'm going to yeah. give just a couple, and then we'll add that to the follow-up email. By the mm -hmm. way, if you're not listening live right now, uh, you can request that via email, and we will send that out to you. And just, just ask for the content from the um, – uh, teaching STEM engineering concepts without losing your mind. Send us an email about that yes. and we'll send this follow-up. But um, there's a couple of them. Learn Engineering, that reminds me of the Teach Engineering. Learn Engineering is great. It has some really, really cool CAD models of all kinds of different things, like a transmission and engines and you know how all kinds of different stuff works. Uh, I Like to Make Stuff is one of my favorites. Um, Bob Claggett does all kinds of cool projects. One of them, he built a... Um, a lightsaber with an Arduino inside and a speaker, so it would make the cool lightsaber sounds as you move it around. <laughs> um, All About Electronics is good. Beauty and the Bolt is cool. And Laura Camp, um, a couple of the females that I like, they have good channels. RC Life On is another good channel if you want to learn about 3D printers. He does a, a bunch of really cool evaluations and prints out cool 3D printing stuff. He also talks about um, RC cars. King of Random does a lot of really fun stuff. Colin Furs. Uh, he's come up recently. He just, I think that the one he just uh, released is called the Chainsaw Powered Lamp. He has a huh. jet bike and a hover bike. He has some really crazy things that he builds. Those are all cool. um, on his channel. So I'll send out a list of some of those. You have any favorites off the top of your head? Uh, for elementary students, I always love Brain Pop. Uh, your school can get like a trial through them, but they have a def many different uh, videos for different subjects, um, mm -hmm. including, you know, if you need something for English and grammar, that can also be helpful for, for you as well. Um, gosh, YouTube is a great source for videos. And I know I always use many different uh, YouTubes for my classroom as well. Yep. If you think of any, we'll add them to the email as yep. well. So I'll put some links to some of these fun ones in here. Okay, here we go. Uh, the, the budget discussion. Um, champagne taste with a beer budget. So this is kind of most people's situation is that you don't always have the finances and the resources for the things you want to do in your classroom. And there's a fundraiser every day selling candy bars and roses and soap and I don't even know what else. Those are good, uh, but they can be kind of taxing, especially on the parents because they're usually the ones that have to go out and do the fundraising anyway. Um, you may have a surplus budget, good, you can just tune out, fast forward this section um, if that's you, 
awesome. Send me some money. Uh, grants, a lot of people know um, about grants. You may need some help writing grants, and there's good resources for that that I think you have, in, um, uh, Megan. But also, if you do the uh, STEM certification course, there is a whole section in that course about grants and where to find grants and, and how to get some, some money. But I wanted to talk about a couple of things that you may not have thought about and how to get money from really in your community. Um, Public-private partnerships are great. We actually have one of these in Tioga, North Dakota, and we have an energy company that does wind and solar power up there. And so because they do business there, they want to give back to their community. And we talked a little bit about how that could work there. And the main thing, I think it's really important to try and figure out like what is in it for that company as well. Because we all know, okay, we'll give to the students, you know, pull on the heartstrings and all that, and that's great. But they have lots of opportunities to give their money away to lots of different organizations. But what I think is the most important is one, being able to share your vision, um, you know, the incitement and the enthusiasm of what you want to do in your classroom for your students is really important but also being able to tie that to their organization and how that benefits the community, how that benefits their company. And when it comes down to it, they need workers that are going to be educated enough to do the jobs that they need filled. And some of those, we don't even know what they are right now. But if you can show how bringing certain technologies or certain STEM activities into your classroom is going to help spark the interest of some of these students to pursue those types of um, All right, I've got it down now, uh, <laughs> reset quickly. So if you're gonna help produce the good quality candidates that those employers need, that is a big benefit to them, okay? Plus it helps get their name out there, they wanna be part of the community. So, so it is important not only to show what you want to do, but also to show that you understand some of their needs and how you're gonna help meet those needs for them. I think that's really important. Um, the Chamber of Commerce in your area and the Economic Development Commission, um, uh, sometimes called a commercial club, there's different names for it, but really, you know, their job is to try and support the businesses in, in the area, create more local businesses, support the local business uh, community, and um, bring businesses into the community. So it takes a lot of uh, time, effort, and money to bring a, a company into your community, right? Well, what about just starting a company in your community? So if you can show how you're teaching your students to be entrepreneurial, teaching your students what they need to know to be successful, then they may stay there and start businesses, not just have to go out and recruit companies to come and locate in your area. I think it's also really important to demonstrate that when, when you invest in your students, and they kind of get a boost or an inspiration from you, and then they go on to a career, they may not realize it at first. And we, even in uh, Columbus, Georgia, where there's a, about a quarter of a million people, it's the second largest population in the state, and we still lose, and we got lots of opportunity here, but we still lose a lot of people to Atlanta and to other larger markets because there's just different opportunities there. But when, if they do go away, you want them to come back. And if they feel a nostalgia, toward where they got their start, that, that teacher that inspired them, um, that company that came in, that person that talked to them, you know, the, the, the tools and things that they had, they'll, they'll get mature and they'll start to realize that those things cost money, they take investment, they take people to actually do the work to make it happen, then there's a good chance that they'll come back into the community and reinvest in the community even in the future. So Chamber of Commerce Economic Development, they are uh, really, 
into making sure that, that, that we don't have too much brain drain out of our cities. And if you can kind of show a connection between STEM education and what you're trying to do in your classroom and how it's going to inspire students, then I think you have a better course, a, a better um, a better opportunity for getting those that funding. And also in that certification course that we talked about, um, it does talk more about grants and some other uh, funding sources. Uh, Megan, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, there's actually, there's some great websites uh, for funding. So there's uh, Donors Choose. You can put up a little uh, excerpt about your classroom project that you would like donors for. And donors get to go through and choose the classrooms that they would like to uh, donate money to. And then there's Grants Alert and Get Ed Funding. Those are some popular um, websites that we uh, at least use here in Michigan. But I have heard, you know, from many professional developments across the country, that those are some of the websites that they use. Uh, but yeah, in our course, we do have a video that describes how to use funding and even how teachers can use the gig economy to uh, help with uh, careers and getting students excited about keeping uh, things local, local and uh, you know working on that development in their own neighborhoods as well. Right. Okay, if you guys have more questions on funding or anything that we've covered so far, again, uh, you can put them in the chat. We have a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, and also, if you're watching this, uh, the recorded version, you can email us and we'll do our best to provide that information and, and find a place on our site that we can post that too. Um, there was a question that came in, uh, some good STEM sites, so some websites to go to. And I had a couple of them. You probably have a few off the top of your head, but. Um, you know, since we deal with uh, microcontrollers, Arduino's website is really great. It's arduino.cc. Uh, the Instructables website is great. Maybe a lot of you know about it, but if you haven't gone to instructables.com, they have tons and tons and tons of projects. I mean, it's kind of a hodgepodge and a mix up of stuff, but you can get a lot of ideas from there. And I personally love Tinkercad. You were talking, Megan, about uh, mixing multiple disciplines in science, mm -hmm. technology, engineering, math. And um, Tinkercad does a great job with that because you can uh, use CAD and it's a really simple uh, web-based interface that you can build all kinds of cool CAD designs. You can export those to your 3D printer. Um, there's lots of cool stuff there, but also they have another section of their site where you can build circuits. Uh, so mm -hmm. even if you don't have the physical components, you can build the circuits and it has an emulator. So they'll actually work on screen. It's really cool. We did our mood lamp project um, on that. And so you can actually change the amount of light for the light dependent resistor. And you'll see the LEDs turn on and off. It's really, really cool. Plus you can add all the coding to it. So you can put your Arduino code and the electronics together on their site. That is a great, a really great free resource for, um, for helping with STEM. Did you have any? That yeah. You could well, I was just going to say that's what I appreciated with Creation Crate is, I mean, it's very multidisciplinary and implementing these different subjects of science um, into engineering and technology, especially with the mood lamps. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I recommend to my teacher friends uh, because what I found when I taught was that we don't always get a chance to hear about these great uh, products or um even you know things that are going on in STEM in the classroom. So I always try to pass those on to my teacher friends. And Creation Crate is one that I do share, um, especially because there's videos uh, that do step by step, um, online uh, lesson plans and guides, so that you can work through those. Uh, so you don't feel alone in trying to accomplish these projects. It's really a guided and uh, something that can get you started in STEM. If you're not sure where to exactly start, um, that's one way I always appreciated being able to be like, okay, here's something I can use yeah. to get me started and get me confident with STEM before I go and try this on my own. Right, yeah, there's lots of big projects you gotta get started somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so you missed a spot. So this is time for Q&A. Well, we've been trying to answer questions as they've, they've come through. And let me see if there's any that we haven't. We t well, you know, that came in earlier, but we talked about the best way to organize electronic parts, those small parts. Um, mm -hmm. The ice cube tray idea is a good one. Um, also, any of your big box retailers, they have those uh, toolboxes that snap close. Those are great. Um, what I would make sure, I would highly recommend just make sure that the dividers snap in tightly so that everything doesn't get mixed up, especially when it's turned upside down or somebody drops it or whatever. 
Um, this is somewhere where, you know, you don't want to go the cheapest route because you'll just end up with a mess on your hands. Another yeah. tip is, um, have, and I stole this from Bricks for Kids, they have like a map on their, their, their box the snap where all the different Legos go. So there's like 10 of these in this bin and five of these in this bin. So it was really easy to put everything back. Because you assume students will just put everything back right where they found it, right? If you have a map, at least you can hold them accountable. So uh, it's one of the things that, that we carry through into our classroom kit. Um, but it's a good idea to have a map, just like with our, the toolbox that I did in class, it had a list of all the items on there. So that's really important to make sure that you get everything back at the end of the day. Uh, how do you organize your tools? That we just kind of answered that. Um, talked about the survey. So yeah, there was I think it wasn't Edmodo. That was one of there was another one that we used too. That I, I'll have to think of that one. So they may be the same yeah. website, but um, but it is cool because you can have the questions and you can survey a class and see all the answers pop up and break them into teams and all kinds of cool stuff. So. We will get the name of that website and put it in the, the outgoing email. Um, I think we've covered everything that we have so far. We just wanted to take a quick minute. I wanted to talk to you uh, real fast about the classroom kit that I mentioned. The classroom kit is a culmination of a lot of work, and we have about 18 different projects right now, actually 20 different projects right now. And uh, this includes 12 of our top beginner projects all in one kit for the classroom. Um, it has all the instructions via PDF, so students can pull them up on their Chromebooks or any other device, and um, a lot of educational video content. And you know, like I said, in my classroom, I learned it was good to have lots of resources and ways that they could find the information. So if you don't like going step by step through the book and you want to just jump into it like I do, then when you get stuck, we have uh, 17 videos that show each of the different components. We have some background videos on getting started in electronics and coding and what the Arduino microcontroller is. All that is accessible um, to the classroom, right? That comes with the kit. We have the online classroom and, and all of that comes with this. Um, turnkey projects. So like I said, we have the instructions, we have high resolution images on our PDF so they can zoom in. All the code is here, which we, we make it so that you don't, the students aren't able to copy and paste it out of the PDF because we want them actually typing and going through the process. And then at the end, we have different challenges and exercises because, okay, you everybody could follow the instructions to the letter and make it work. It usually doesn't. So there's usually going to be some troubleshooting involved no matter what, especially the first couple projects when you're kind of learning that you can't forget a semicolon. But even at the end, we want to make sure that students have actually learned something so we put some challenges and some exercises that will require them to take what they've learned, go back through the code or go back to the circuit and change it so it behaves differently. And these are great for uh, measuring comprehension and seeing what the students have learned. Um, yeah, here's all the classroom, some of the different videos, this is what our instruction booklets look like. So everything that you need for those projects, these are our Facebook Messenger tokens. You can snap a picture of one of these. It has the component in there, and it'll take you right to Facebook for uh, the video. So we have our videos on Vimeo, they're on our website, they're on YouTube, um, and they're on Facebook. So I know some classes or some schools are locked down for some of these different sites like YouTube uh, or Facebook. So if we, we've tried to give you lots of different resources to be able to find what you're looking for and be able to use this in the classroom easily. And then I did mention that our products are STEM.org approved, but maybe Megan, can you give them a little bit of background on STEM.org and everything that you guys do and what you offer? Yeah, we've been an organization that's been around for 17 years. Uh, we're not, you know, we're, we know STEM. Uh, we've worked with students. Uh, we've created, um, it started as kind of like a field trip base projects for students, taking them out to, you know, really work in that local community and see those problems and create solutions for them. Uh, as time went on, we really then started focusing on STEM certifying teachers, STEM accrediting schools, and STEM approving products. So you see that Creation Crate is a STEM approved product. So it's gone through a very uh, specific assessment that, uh, again, it's a 100 point assessment going through specific uh, 
parts of STEM and how it's going to reach those pieces. So if we talk about 21st century skills, how does Creation Crate do that? And so um, it's gone through uh, this assessment and within uh, with this score, it many projects you would have to do an 82 or better. Uh, so Creation Crate, you know, surpassed this with, um, you know, no problem at all. It was something that I appreciated as a teacher and could really see uh, setting that bar for products to being STEM approved. Uh, but we've, you know, we worked with learning resources, ETA Hand to Mind, uh, NASCAR, Hasbro. Uh, you know, we really help companies understand what is STEM and how they can provide products to parents, teachers, students that actually do work in STEM. It's not just that bag of sand that says STEM on it. Like it's gone through a legitimate assessment and it will right. make a difference in that student's STEM career. STEM's kind of become a buzzword and I see it people has. putting it on like, oh, we glued some noodles onto a paper plate and made a <laughs> smiley face. It's a STEM project. I'm like, ah, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> So um, knowing that like you have 820 products that you've approved, so um, there's lots of variety out there be besides us. Um, one of the things I know you guys have been working really hard on is your certification. And you've had over 13,000, I see here, um, people that have been become STEM certified teachers. Yes. And that's like a multi-thousand dollar course um, if you're, if you're going to do it live. And... Um, what I love is you guys have taken all of that and put it into a learning management system and got it, gotten it down to a really low price point. How, how much is that to have the STEM certification? How many hours do they spend doing that? What, and like, what kind of resources do they have access to once they're done? Sure. So the cost is $595. And when you complete our STEM certification course, you receive 1,100 plus pages of content. And this content is just, it provides you a variety of ideas, robotics, fashion, uh, arts, uh, mobile, and uh, coding. We also sports, so bringing uh, STEM into sports as well. Uh, so we provide quite a variety for teachers. And uh, with this, you know, you start kind of at your basic structure of what STEM is. And then throughout, you really get into those more challenging concepts and you're provided resources that you can bring right into your classroom. So what's great, what I love about this course is that, um, you know, it's it's more real world for what I see is that, you know, I can take these concepts and implement them the next day. And, yeah. uh, and then, you know, it's something that you can also, um, when you're done, you'll be part of like a global alumni base. So you're connecting with teachers uh, also. So you can see, you know, what, what changes did they make to the content? What worked? What didn't work? You know, how can I use this? So we're not just saying, okay, here's your STEM course and now you're done. We want to be able to provide opportunities for teachers to grow and continue to improve, you know, their classroom or accomplish the goals that they've set. And that's so really important for us. Are, th those materials are constantly being updated and you're constantly adding yes. to it. So whatever, you know, however, however that grows, once you have your certification, you have access to that as long as you're certified. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's just a three year renewal. And so, uh, you know, as you renew, uh, it's about, you know, what the newest STEM concepts, you know, how you've been able to keep with STEM, kind of new goals being set. So it's, you know, you're continuously improving and not just a one and done idea. It's about being able to grow together and create a sustainable STEM practice for your classroom. And, and I think it's a lot easier to convince your administration um, when you don't have to have travel expenses. Um, it's easier for the teacher because you can do it on your own time. I think it's like mm -hmm. 50 to 75 hours worth of, of, of online experience, right? Yeah. You, um, so in the state of Michigan, we have sketch hours. So these hours um, are used towards renewing your teacher certification. And, you know, we also asked teachers from other states that, hey, if you, you know, appreciated our program, bring it to uh, those that can help bring hours to your state. Um, and we'd be happy mm -hmm. to work with them so that your hours count to renewing your certification. Uh, Cause you, you know, it's important. Those hours, I mean, 
that like can take a lot of time out of your day. It's your professional development. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, one last thing, because we're partnering um, on a project that we want to talk. So there, we're, we're selecting um, about 20 to 25 classrooms that we would like to participate in a case study. So there's an opportunity. Uh, if you're one of those ambitious teachers and you would like to help us with this case study, we want to track students um, over the course of a year and see how these kinds of hands-on STEM projects and STEM activities in the classroom help impact their overall grades, their overall scores, their standardized test scores, and so on, so that we can kind of see, like, are we being effective? How effective are, are we at this? Does this make a difference? Um, and there's some time and some effort that's involved with that. So in order to do that and to um, you know, get some, some classrooms to participate and to uh, kind of give back to the teachers, we've put together um, a package. So if you're interested, you can email us. But generally, the, the cost of the kits is $250 per kit. Um, and, and so that the parts are reusable in those kits. It services one to two students. We usually don't recommend having more than two students work on it. Otherwise, somebody's left not doing anything. Um, so if you got, let's say, 25 kits, that would cover an entire classroom, that would be 6250 We do have a partner, um, which is Dakota Public Relations, and they have helped us reduce that cost for you guys. And also STEM.org has come to the table, and any of the teachers that are participating in this will also get their online certification course for free, which again we said is a $595 value. So Normally, this would all add up to about 4,700 bucks, but if you participate in the case study with us and you get approved to do that, then that would bring the cost down to 2145. So that is a significant savings, and I think that there's, there's a lot of value in this. If you're interested, please send us an email. You can even email me directly at david at creationcrate.com, or you can go to our website, and uh, there's many ways to get in touch with us, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all kinds of stuff. So, um, but this, this is just an option for some of you guys, you know, ambitious teachers out there. Here are the websites. I, I don't know, I think this might be covering, I think our faces might be covering up part of stem.org, but of course you can go to creationpate.com, girlsthatmake.com and learn more about our home delivery project. So we have subscription based. If you have just, you know, students, kids, or people that you know that would be interested in getting this at home. And then our classroom kit, some more information about that on our website here. And then, of course, lots of information at stem.org. Highly encourage you to go check them out as well. Megan, any last parting thoughts before we uh, let everybody go? Uh, you know, feel free to email me at um, megan at stem.org. If you have any questions or would want inf more information on STEM accrediting your school or becoming STEM certified, we're happy to help and here to give you some ideas as well if you need some guidance in the STEM area. Beautiful. Okay. Well, um, hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. Again, if you have questions, um, there will be a replay. We will put this on our website. Um, I think it'll end up being posted to YouTube, but you'll have a link that you can find at uh, creationcrate.com. So you can share this also and um, let other people watch it if they're interested. But if you want the email follow-up, that's going to, oh, we didn't even mention this. Out of those 1,100 pages of content, STEM.org is providing three of the lessons mm -hmm. for free for anybody that's watched the webinar. So in the email that we will send up as a follow-up, you'll get three free lessons from STEM.org. You will get a copy of the, um, the learning styles slide that we have. So we have that in a PDF format that we'll be able to provide for you. Um, also, I think the checklist on evaluating STEM projects, we'll put that in there. We're gonna put a list of websites that you can go to for STEM content. And we'll put a list of uh, some of our favorite YouTube channels and other STEM content websites. All that will be packaged up in the email. So if you weren't on this live, if you're live, you'll be getting it automatically. If you're not, then send us an email. Say you've watched the webinar, and we will get that email out to you as well. Um, all right. Thanks for joining. We appreciate you guys. Megan, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing you. so much information with us.